So today, what I will be talking about is overviewing basically the new therapies that were approved in 2017 for acute myeloid leukemia, which has been a very special year because we have not had approvals in a long time, as I will show you in a minute. So these are my disclosures. I work with a lot of pharma companies in my capacity as a clinical investigator. And acute myeloid leukemia, I think there are several challenges associated with it. Um, one of them is that um, most of the patients are older, so this makes a lot of them difficult in terms of giving them uh, intensive therapies. And as you can see in this graph, the median age is 68 years old, so most of the patients are older than that. And as you can see, the overall mortality or survival rate at five years is around 25%. But that is significantly affected by the age of the patient. So patients who are older generally don't do well. And this has not significantly changed over time. However, what we are starting to realize over the last 10 years, I think, is that AML is not really a single disease. It's a heterogeneous number of diseases. And as you can see in this uh, graph, basically, there's a large number of entities within AML that are uh, different in terms of the pathogenesis and how you potentially target them. And this is becoming important clinically because we are trying to target specific subtypes based on uh, specific therapies, as we'll be talking about. And for a long time in AML and I would say MDS as well, which I do as well, we've been very jealous of the other hematologic malignancies with all the approvals that were coming, as you can see here for lymphomas and lymphoplastic leukemia. AML, for a long time, there was no approval, basically, until 2017. And uh, you can see here, from 1970, when 7 plus 3, 1973 was introduced more than 45 years ago, um, there has not been significant uh, improvements, aside from the introduction of hydrobesin in the 90s. But last year alone, four new drugs were approved. And what I will be doing in this talk is actually cover the clinical data supporting the use of these drugs and their uh, standard indications and Later in the talk, we'll have a debate about uses in the off-label setting as well as how uh, to foresee the future and how things might change over the next five years. So I'm going to start talking about the first drug, midostorin. So FLET3 mutations in AML are quite common. Around 30% of AML patients will have a FLET3 mutation. The most common version is what we call the ITD or internal tandem publication. Um, there's a, a one called tyrosine kinase domain mutation, which happens in around 5 to 10 percent of patients as well. These are one of the, um, I would say, uh, most common mutations, but as well as one of the least favorable, especially the ITD, because they drive a certain uh, phenotype that's associated with a high white cell count, more aggressive presentation, very high relapse rate, and generally those patients do poorly. And um, for those of you who are interested, this uh, review by Dr. Stone, who has been uh, a leader in, in the uh, introduction of midostorin to clinical use, overviews the story of midostorin, which really started more than 30 years ago, since 1986 when the drug was initially synthesized and subsequent development through other indications and uh, subsequent move to AML as the FLET3 story, FLET3 story became more apparent. So midostorin, basically, this is the Ratify uh, trial, which is the, the landmark phase three trial that led to the approval of the drug. And this is the overall design in which patients were randomized to seven plus three versus seven, seven plus three with midostorin versus seven plus three uh, plus placebo. And uh, this trial was actually um, a huge effort in, co in collaboration between academia and pharma. More than 3,000 patients were screened to get around 700, uh, uh, 717 patients who had FLET3 positive AML. And for those of you who, do, who are not very familiar with the leukemia trials, to get such a number of patients with the leukemia tri uh, trial is an outstanding effort because many of these patients, it's a rare cancer to begin with, and many of these patients don't undergo uh, trials because many times tri uh, therapy is initiated quite quickly. So these are the baseline characteristics in the study. As you can see, the arms were generally quite well uh, balanced. The study allowed patients who have FLET3 um, with tyrosine kinase domain mutation as well as 
patients who have uh, uh, lower allelic ratio with the ITD. So if you have less than 0.7 versus more than 0.7, and the patients were stratified according to that, because there is data that the allelic ratio can affect the outcome of patients with FLT3 mutations. And this is, this is a slide that represents the top line results of that study. As you can see, there was an overall survival advantage by the addition of midostorin to the standard 7 plus 3. Uh, you can see in the right lower graph that this was consistent across the different mutations, the low ITD ratio, uh, allelic ratio, the high, as well as the tyrosine kinase domain. And I think the number that I often like to quote to my patients is the fact that the four-year survival was 51% with the midostorin compared to 44%, so 7% improvement at the four-year uh, overall survival. You can see here that there's a median overall survival advantage, but for different statistical reasons, I think this number um, over inflates the benefit of the drug, and I generally don't use it when I talk to my patients. In terms of toxicity, the drug, the addition of uh, midostorin was actually um, not uh, that toxic. Generally, if you look at most of the side effects, they were evenly balanced between the two groups. The only increase was in rashes. But the other side effects that you see in this table are very common for induction of AML, such as infections and febrile neutropenia and mucositis diarrhea. Um, in this trial, around 57% of patients went to transplant, and transplant was not part of the trial um, design. Basically, the patients were allowed to go for transplant, but it was not required. And this was a large number of, uh, you know, transplants in, in this trial, and uh, that basically affected some of the results in a way that we'll discuss in the next couple of slides. And very importantly, when you censor at the time of transplant, the survival advantage was still maintained. This is a common technique we use to try to isolate the uh, effect of transplant from new therapies in trials in which patients can go to transplant. <coughs> Maintenance, which was part of the design of the trial, so the patients got midostorin during induction during uh, consolidation and subsequently one year maintenance of single agent midostorin. And there has been a lot of controversy basically whether maintenance of uh, using midostorin actually helps survival or not. Uh, Dr. Larson presented an, uh, a subgroup analysis in this last ASH looking at the maintenance, uh, basically an unplanned analysis looking at the uh, question of maintenance. And basically the conclusion was doing different statistical techniques that it's not clear if maintenance is really adding value uh, for the treatment. And that could be for a couple of reasons. One of them is that there was no subsequent randomization before maintenance, so the patients were randomized from the get-go and they continued whether they are on midostorin or placebo. And a second reason is that we, uh, we don't have a good sense of what was the MRD, the minimum residual disease status, before going to maintenance. So when you look at the overall survival or disease-free survival, there was no significant difference. And that actually led to the FDA not approving the maintenance uh, part of uh, the use of midostorin. However, in Europe, it's approved. So the conclusions here basically is that the addition of midostorin to 7 plus 3 improved overall survival. Um, this definitely is, a, I would consider, a new standard care for patients who have FLT3 mutations who are younger than 60 who are uh, transplant, uh, who are intensive chemo eligible. While we don't know uh, for sure if the maintenance did uh, add to the benefit, I think most of us, at, or at least personally, I think this is how the trial was done and how it was designed, and I usually would go to maintenance if the patient does not go for transplant. So there are a number of FLT3 inhibitors, and I'm going to let Dr. Stone talk to you more about how we are going to foresee uh, the future and how things are going to change, but there are a number of FLT3 inhibitors that are in advanced testing. So for CPX, this is the other uh, drug that uh, has been approved. Some of you might not be familiar with the, with the name. So Vixius is actually a trade name, but it's a liposomal formulation of uh, 7 plus 3. You know, we used to joke that we call it 7 plus 3 in a papel. So basically, you have this liposome in which you have a um, and 5 to 1 molar ratio of cytorapine to donorobicin. And this was based on preclinical studies that showed that having this specific ratio actually leads to the best synergistic activity between cytorabine and uh, donorobicin. And uh, in early studies, basically, including this phase 2 
trial in newly diagnosed patients who were 60 to 71, uh, 75 year old, um, basically who were randomized to CPX, which was given as 100 units in day one and three and five, compared to standard seven plus three, in which the response rate was the primary endpoint. What was found, as you can see, that the response rate in, in the overall group, it wasn't significantly different. The median survival was 14 months versus 12.9 months. But in a subgroup analysis, what they noticed was that in the secondary AMLs, there was a significant difference, as you can see in the right lower hand of the curve, where the survival was 12 months versus six months. And there wasn't any, and until now, I think there is no clear explanation of why are we seeing this differential in patients with secondary AML and therapy-related AML. However, based on that data, they went to a phase three study, which was led by Dr. Lancet, and um, this has been presented in ASCO 2016. The actual study has not yet been published. Um, so several of those slides are actually coming from that specific study, uh, from that presentation. But this is how the study was done. The CPX was, the patients were randomized to CPX versus seven plus three for one to two induction cycles, followed by consolidation. And this is how we usually give the drug. So we give it on day one, three, one, three, and five during induction. If we need a second induction, we only give in day one and three. And for consolidation, we use a lower dose of 75 units per meter square on day one and three. So again, baseline characteristics were not significantly uh, different. And as you can see in the lower part of the slide, in terms of the distribution of the patients, so many of those patients were therapy-related AMLs or um, AML arising from MDS or CMML, or AML with uh, uh, basically MDS karyotype. You can see here that the complete response rate with CPX was significantly higher, as well as a combination of CR and CRI, complete response with complete count recovery. And this is the top line result in terms of overall survival. Uh, so there was a significant survival prolongation with the CPX uh, compound with 9.5 months compared to six months, basically three and a half month prolongation on overall survival. And this is the data that led to the approval of the drug. I think one of the interesting aspects of, of this drug is that uh, there is a, a significant reduction in, in the death rate in the first 30 and 60 days. And some of that seems to be related to progressive disease. When you look at death to adverse events in the first 60 days, it doesn't seem to be significantly different. But when you specifically look at this secondary to progressive AML, there's a, a significant difference that's leading, um, basically leading to that 60-day mortality uh, difference. When you censor basically at time of transplant to try to isolate the effect of the drug from transplant, we don't see the same uh, survival difference. Um, and this could be related to power issues and other factors. And when basically uh, you look at the patients from the time of transplant, what they found is that patients who underwent transplant after CPX tended to have a much better survival that was statistically significant. And that also is not clear in terms of why is that. Is it because these patients have a lower MRD level at the time of transplant if they had CPX or is it because they are less sick when they undergo transplant because the treatment is less toxic. In terms of toxicity, actually, while they are, uh, the infectious complications are not uh, significantly higher, however, the time to recovery with CPX is actually longer. So it's 35 days uh, to ANC of more than 500. So it's around a week longer to recover for both ANC and platelets. So in conclusions, the drug led to improvement in overall survival, um, and for that reason, it was approved in patients who are 60 to 75 year old who had therapy-related AML or had AML with uh, myelodysplasia-related changes. In the last five, uh, six minutes, I'm going to talk about gemtuzumab ozogamycin, which is the anti-CD33 antibody drug conjugate. So this, probably many of you might be familiar with this drug because it was approved in 2000 and was removed from the market in 2010 and came back again in 2017. So it, this is basically the trial that um, was done that led to the removal of the drug from, uh, or voluntary withdrawal of the drug from the market. 
when basically the drug was given at a dose of six milligram uh, in combination with chemotherapy. And I think many people um, currently feel that this dose was somewhat too high and this is what was causing the negative results of, of that study. So we saw a significantly higher uh, mortality uh, risk during the induction. And because this study results were negative and uh, there was an association with a higher mortality risk, this was the reason why the drug was withdrawn. However, multiple studies, especially in Europe, have shown that when you use a lower dose, a fractionated dose of gemtuzumab, basically on, like in this study, the alpha study, in which uh, gemtuzumab was given with three plus, uh, seven plus three, um, and on day one, three, and uh, in day one, four, and seven, at three milligram per meter square, um, what you can see here, I, this is a slide with the top line results, that the relapse-free survival was actually significantly improved, and a secondary outcome was the overall survival, and there was also an improvement. And the toxicity, there is somewhat higher toxicity when you add the drug to um, basically to seven plus three. However, there was a survival advantage, and as well as the patients are managed well, um, I think it's very reasonable to use in that setting. Importantly, most of the data um, in this meta-analysis that I'm showing you here, basically, what it has shown is that patients who have intermediate or favorable risk, basically, core binding factor leukemias or intermediate risk leukemias are the ones who benefit the most and not the patients who have adverse um, karyotype. And the drug also um, has been uh, used as single agent against compared to best supportive care in patients who are older and unfit. And in this trial, the median overall survival was 4.9 months compared to 3.6 months, which was statistically significant. This might not look very impressive to you, but this is actually the one of the, uh, probably the only study in older unfit patients who showed a survival advantage, a randomized phase three study. And the drug has been also approved in the relapsed refractory setting. So it's a wide approval. Frontline fit patients in combination with seven plus three, single agent for older unfit patients and in the relapsed refractory setting. And we are still trying to understand what are the predictive uh, markers basically. So having normal karyotype, uh, core binding factor leukemia seem to be better than adverse karyotype as well as certain CD3 expression and SNP, uh, SNP uh, polymorphisms in the gene seem to be associated with the response to the drug. So in the last few minutes, I'm just gonna cover the last drug, which is uh, in a SIDNIP, the IDH2 inhibitor. So isocitrate dehydrogenase, basically uh, mutations in this enzyme have been shown to be important. So this enzyme, what it does is basically it uh, converts um, isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate. When there's a mutation, you end up with this oncometabolite called 2-hydroxyglutarate, and this leads to epigenetic changes and effects at the DNA uh, repair, which leads to leukogenesis and it actually occurs in around 20% of AML patients. Uh, IDH2 mutation occur in around 10 to 15% of patients, while the IDH1 occur in around 5 to 7% of patients. This drug was uh, somewhat unusual. It was up in, in the sense that it was approved based on a phase one uh, study, which is, was a big phase one, but it was basically a single arm in the, uh, as you can see here with multiple cohorts with dose escalation and ultimately the dose of 100 milligram PO daily is what was taken for um, the largest expansion. And what you can see in this slide that the response rate was around 40% overall response rate. However, the CR rate was around 20%. And the median survival was nine months. So these are patients with relapsed refractory leukemia. So I think nine month is a reasonable survival. Although of course this is a there is no direct comparison here. We are using historical controls for comparison. Patients who achieve complete remission have a median survival of 20 months. So patients who achieve remission tend to do quite well. Differentiation syndrome is something we worry about. Um, it it uh, requires some uh, um, high degree of suspicion, especially in situations where uh, patients might have an increasing white cell count after you start them on the drug. It's somewhat uh, similar to what you see with ATRA, but I think uh, we are still trying to understand exactly the pathophysiology and the differentiating e effect of the drug. However, if that happens, it can lead to 
uh, deaths. So it's very important to monitor and observe the patient, hold the drug, and uh, potentially give steroids. So in the last uh, minute, I'm just going to talk about some of the studies that were just presented in ASH. So the drug has been approved in the refractory lab setting, but there are ongoing studies using a combination of IDH inhibitors, whether the inacidinib, the IDH2 that's approved, as well as the ivocidinib, which is the IDH1 inhibitor that has also undergone extensive uh, testing, and currently the FDA is reviewing the data. So this is a trial that combined the drug with azacitidine. Um, it's early results, uh, encouraging results, but again, I think it's a, such a small number of patients, 19 patients, that I don't think you can make any solid conclusions. And another study was presented in which the IDH inhibitors were combined with 7 plus 3, and this was a phase 1 trial. Again, overall responses were somewhat encouraging, but in my mind, again, too early to make any kind of solid conclusions until we go to, uh, you know, a larger study. So in conclusion, the landscape of treatment options for patients with acute myeloid leukemia has changed significantly. Um, for sure, adding midostorin for patients who are fit and chemotherapy eligible with 7 plus 3 is important and I think is a, currently a standard of care. CPX could be considered for patients who are uh, 60 to 75 who have therapy-related AML or myelodysplasia-related changes. Gemtuzumab has a wide also uh, approval in the frontline relapse refractory uh, setting as well as older unfit patients. And we need to understand how to combine these therapies and how to use them in the future. And this is uh, what will be discussed in the next two sessions in the debate and then the talk by Dr. Stone. Thank you so much.